Uh, thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers and especially Somnath for answering all my questions about how to get to India. Um, it's my first time. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to give, like Somnath said, uh, kind of a series of lectures. And the theme is um, uh, Legendrian contact homology. Um, so uh, it's a long name, so I'll just kind of generally abbreviate it by LCH. Um, and uh, <clears throat> by the way, first I have to apologize. I only had about two hours of sleep last night and two hours the night before. So I'm a. But luckily, this is the first lecture, so I think I've got just enough to get through. Um, but we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. So. Um, so. All right. What's the uh, the kind of the bigger picture of this thing? So this is a tool, but what's where does it fit? Um, so. Um, Oh, and also I have to apologize. I wasn't here, obviously, yesterday or the day before, and I know that there were some talks introductory um, uh, in line with what I'm talking about, and uh, so hopefully it's not, I'm not going to repeat anything that's not worth repeating. Um, but okay, so, um, so there's this dichotomy in uh, symplectic geometry. Um, well, is it symplectic geometry or topology? Um, so there are other. So what does that mean? So um, well, there's other kind of adjectives or descriptive words for this. Uh, this is called um, rigidity versus looseness, um, and the idea uh, behind topology. It, you know, if you forget the word symplectic, but just the idea behind topology is that there's kind of, uh, you know, lo no local invariance, except, of course, for dimension. Whereas in geometry, there's lots of rich, there's lots of local uh, structure. Uh, like, for example, curvature. So there's this classic uh, balance between these two fields, uh, these two points of view. Is it symplectic geometry or is it symplectic topology? And you know, there's not a there's not a uh, one or the other answer. Um, you know, <coughs> if you kind of imagine it, some as there's some sort of scale maybe. So um, you know, first there's. Let's say this is this is uh, topology versus geometry. Um, so you know, first there's this theorem called Darboux's theorem, um, which basically says that if you're talking about a symplectic manifold or a contact manifold locally, it looks like the standard symplectic or contact manifold. Um, so that's kind of in the area of topology. Locally, manifolds look like Euclidean space. Um, but then, of course, there is this um, the kind of the, maybe the theme of this, conf this conference. There was uh, Gromov's, uh, he's got to be bigger, uh, Gromov's uh, compactness result uh, for uh, pseudo holomorphic curves or J holomorphic curves in a symplectic manifold. And you know, with this uh, result, he proved this celebrated not squeezing theorem um, using these holomorphic curves, um, where essentially, if you take a symplectic ball, um, so this means two n dimensions, and this is a ball of radius one, and uh, uh, you can't embed it into. Um, if one of the dimensions, you know, two of the dimensions were a little bit smaller than one, and the other remaining dimensions were huge, 
Um, so this was kind of a, the first of many results coming from this, these geomorphic curves, all of which demonstrated that this would really be called geometry, that this is kind of this, there are these local things that make it not like topology. Um, you know, maybe the most um, celebrated one, arguably, this Arnold conjecture. Um, um, but at, at the other hand, there were, there were things more recent than just Darboux's theorem. So I think this was talked about, or, yeah. Sorry? The, the non squeezing. Well, it, it's, it's um, I would say it's more like the applications of, of the compactness theorem, not so much the compactness theorem itself, but just the ability to use holomorphic curves and all the different creative ways they've been done, these two being two, two uh, particular ones. Um, so, um, I'll just throw this out here in case it was covered, but there was, you know, a result of Eli Ashberg about um, Eli Ashberg's um, H principle, let's say, for um, over-twisted uh, contact three manifolds. So if that hasn't been covered, um, you know, um, That's okay, it's just a, it's not really relevant for this talk, but it's just uh, this idea that uh, kind of algebraic topology or homotopy theory is kind of all that is behind the richness of contact structures in this particular case. Uh, and there were other kind of results of that nature. Um, anyway, so I, myself, I was born around here. That is, you know, started my PhD. Um, and so, to me, it was just this preponderance of evidence of, of rigidity and uh, a geomet geometric side to symplectic geometry, not to topological side. But since then, there have been other things, um, you know, uh, at least in my particular area, these kind of loose Legendrians, which are kind of the analog of, of um, a, a kind of an H-principle analog for Legendrians inside contact manifolds. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's not so obvious at all if there's a winning side. Um, so even though this, this conference does focus on the rigidity side and holomorphic curves, there is this competing side here. And, uh, you know, so rather than the question of, like, is it symplectic topology or is it symplectic geometry, because it's both, kind of the new question is, is, like, where's the dividing line? Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll put a first open question down. Uh, and it's really open in the sense that the question isn't even really well phrased. Um, but let's say this. Uh, so given that there's a dividing line between the topology side and the geometry side of symplectic and contact geometry, um, uh, do holomorphic curves capture all of the rigidity? Um, so, and you could kind of take that question in any particular context. So like, for example, you know, first you maybe want to look at, say, Lagrangian submanifolds and symplectic manifolds and say, well, there's looseness and rigidity. Can I, do I have enough holomorphic curves, enough technology, enough algebra to capture any possible rigidity phenomenon that could be measured in, in Lagrangians? Uh, and, you know, um, Generally, they, they are our best tool, so it's kind of like evidence is pointing towards yes to this question, but they're not the only tool. Uh, there are other things, although eventually these other things tend to be equated to a holomorphic curve theory. So, um, okay. Um, all right, so that's kind of the, the, kind of the motivating, uh, kind of the bigger picture of this whole series of talks. Uh, so let's just focus a bit more about the context of this talk. Um, the context of the talks, I mean. 
of um, so uh, so first of all I'm going to be mostly on, I'm going to basically just be on this geometric side the namely the holomorphic curve techniques um, and so the geometric input that I'm talking about here so first of all we have to what space are we in so we're going to be in these odd dimensional uh, contact manifolds. And they're Legendrian submanifolds. So that's going to be the geometric input. There's going to be some auxiliary choices, uh, which is. Uh, Um, that we're going to need, so notably holomorphic curves. So we're going to need uh, we're going to need um, a, what's called an almost complex structure. Um, um, a Reeb vector field. All of these things are going to be defined are, are, are to be defined. Um, but anyway, so they're going to have this geometric input. Um, and the algebraic output is going to be some kind of uh, count of holomorphic curves. Some J holomorphic curves. Um. <clears throat> And then, and then interpretations thereof. Uh, so what does this algebraic output tell us? Now, here are kind of the issues whenever you deal. So this is kind of, so far I'm dealing, this is a standard, standard situation with people working with holomorphic curves. You have some al geometric input and some algebraic output, and then you interpret it. Uh, and you say, therefore, we have another rigidity result in contact geometry. Yeah. Ah, ah right. So. Um, so I'll say, I'll say a little bit later, but it's basically going to be, it's, we, uh, an odd dimensional contact manifold doesn't have an almost complex structure. The first thing is you need to be even dimensional. So uh, it's going to be defined on the symplectization, which I'll define later also, uh, of the contact manifold. Um, OK. So there are some issues when you try to do this. Um, when you try to do, uh, oops. No. One is um, this count is often hard to define. That is, you have to make sure your geometric setup is uh, um, I'm trying to think of an appropriate word for kosher. Uh, what's the analog of that here? I'm not sure. Anyway, kosher, uh, good enough. Um, uh, <clears throat> in order for your theory to be well defined. Uh, and so issues behind this are things like there's, you know, um, there's transversality, which I think. Uh, Chris Wendell may talk about, just judging by the title of, of his talk and just knowing the stuff that he tends to do. Uh, there's these big major transversality issues, um, which can often be resolved by things, uh, by so-called Kurinishi structures, um, polyfolds. These are the buzzwords uh, behind define this count. This is all functional analysis. I'm not going to talk about any of this, but it is a big branch of the symplectic geometry research world, the people trying to make this count well-defined. Uh, another issue, so supposing the count of holomorphic curves is well-defined, and you're allowed to do this, okay? You've passed all the rules. Then you actually have to do it. How do you count these curves? It's uh, The count uh, is hard to do. 
you just walk in and you see some symplectic manifold with some Lagrangian boundary or maybe something with some sort of geometric input, you, you know, you're talking about... So I think Somnath said this was covered in the July lectures. Uh, anyway, you, you, these pseudo-homomorphic curves are solutions to the so-called Z-bar equation, and finding these solutions can be hard. Um, oftentimes, you do some sleight of hand and you say, there are no solutions for some index reason or something like that, and, you know, it's kind of like a... A brush under the rug, maybe, I don't know. So this is what this talk will be about. Um, so, um, so in this talk, so, so these talks, I guess I should say, is how to, how to make the count combinatorial. Now, once you make it combinatorial, that doesn't mean it's automatically easy to do. There are still hard algebraic combinatorial problems. Like if I have two algebraic structures, how do I tell if they're the same or different? I mean, that's a... Um, so usually what happens is you actually kind of some, take some offshoot, some derivative, uh, not, not in the math sense, but in the general word sense, some derivative of this algebraic structure, something easier to see. But nonetheless, this bypasses you know, the, the, the geometric and analytical complexity. It kind of reduces the problem to combinatorics, if that's appropriate to say. So that's what I'm going to... Um, oh, and also, it's not just combinatorial, it's going to also be local. So um, this is, this is a, uh, could be kind of surprising, because uh, holomorphic curves... are not local. So what do I mean by that? I mean, so just suppose you have like a, you know, a, um, a real analytic function, and you know, the, you know the function perfectly at a point, including all its derivatives. Just one point, you know the whole function everywhere. You can't just change a function, it's not like a smooth function that you can just change in a little area and then keep it fixed. Otherwise, the whole thing changes. It's a global phenomenon. Same with the holomorphic curves. They're not local in that nature. Uh, you can't have two holomorphic curves agree on a small little neighborhood and not be the same entirely. There's a kind of uniqueness of continuation argument. Um, but nonetheless, in this case, you can kind of, in the case that I'm going to be working with, Legendrian submanifolds, you can kind of change your input in an allowable way so that all the holomorphic curves are kind of in little pieces of the spaces. And so the counting has been reduced to local computations. Um, and that, that's a, a step towards this combinatorial aid. Okay, so, um, and there's a number of different ways in which, I should say this sometimes, yeah. No. Okay, um, so let me just, uh, before I go get into the overview of this, yeah. Yeah, compactness, um, although that's probably, of all the issues, that's the one that people feel the most comfortable about, because there's Gromov's original compactness theorem, and then you just have to kind of make sure it's true in this setup, and this setup, and that setup. Um, but yeah, uh, com uh, compactness. Uh, there's also this thing called gluing, which is the other side of the story of compactness. These polyfolds are supposed to kind of incorporate all of those at the same time. But yeah, these are, these are the three kind of... First, this one. Well, these two can be done in either order. Gluing has to be done after transversality. But those are the three kind of... And then there's, I guess, there's the setup as well. Fred Holmness, so on. Okay. Um, so, uh, let me just draw one more uh, picture, because I've thrown out some words. Um, so I'm just going to throw in, uh, put up a uh, general picture of what's of how of what our setup is, our geometric setup, and this relates to this question about the symplectization. Um, so, um, so, like I said, this talk is um, where did I say that? Um, we're dealing with odd-dimensional contact manifolds and their Legendrian submanifolds. Um, how does that relate to symplectic geometry? Um, Uh, this 
So the, the relation of, of, of the context of this talk, I should say. So basically, there's this picture that you tend to draw in these kind of lectures. So you, you kind of draw a contact manifold like this. So, and uh, I'll have to define, yeah. Well, maybe I don't have to do this yet. So you say you have a, two contact manifolds. M plus and M minus. And then you have a symplectic cobordism. It's actually a directed cobordism. So unlike in topology, uh, well, a directed symplectic cobordism. Um, which I'll explain what that is later. Um, and then you have, uh, you, have some, you have maybe some Legendrian here, which I'm going to call L plus, Legendrian submanifold in this contact manifold. And then you have another one here, L minus. And then relating these two, you have uh oh, maybe I didn't do enough for these. Well, I can just draw it however I want to. <laughs> you have a, what's called an exact Lagrangian cobordism. Let's say lambda. Okay. So the picture of Lagrangians and symplectic manifolds, and so Lagrangian submanifolds inside, and I'll define again what exact means, inside a symplectic manifold naturally fits in this in a picture like this for uh, Legendrian submanifolds inside contact manifolds. And so this is kind of the, again, this is the geometric, out, the geometric input. And then um, the algebraic output, in this case, uh, well, there'll be some sort of Legendrian contact homology for the positive side, for the, oh, I guess I was using L. The so Legendrian contact homology it's this, it has inputs, which I haven't defined yet, but the inputs are going to be the manifolds and their contact manifolds, their submanifolds, and some auxiliary data. And you'll have uh, the Legendrian contact homology of the negative side. And then you're going to have some morphism. Um, some morphism which is based on your symplectic manifold and the Lagrangian cobordism from the Legendrian upstairs to the Legendrian downstairs. By the way, in case you're drawing this, I actually did kind of mean to draw it not as a cylinder but as something expanding because this is also part of the picture. There's, there's going to be a symplectic form here that goes, that grows as you go in the positive in, infinite direction. So it really is supposed to look like this. Um, uh, and uh, one uh, particularly useful example of this uh, um, so this has been shown to be useful in a lot of ways but in, like, in particular this evening's talk I don't know, although Somnath might not get to it but in not contact homology uh, Lenny Ang showed how useful this was um, is when uh, um, both the contact manifold and the Legendrian submanifold downstairs are empty. Um, or actually, or actually I should say, or just they're the same and this one is empty. Um, and uh, this is called um, uh, geometrically, it's called a, a filling, a Lagrangian symplectic filling. And algebraically, uh, this is called an augmentation. It's a uh, a morphism from whatever you're working with up here, which is going to be a differential graded algebra, to the ground field or ground ring thought of as in the same, 
set up. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the overview of 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 um, what we're going to talk about. Oh, maybe I should just. Is this visible here? Or is it okay? All right. Um, let me just give you a quick schedule. This is kind of what I'm kind of hoping to get done. We'll see if this actually happens. But um, so I have 3.6 days. Uh, so I'm. This is my best guess, and I'm basing it on the number of sheets of paper of this presentation. But the problem is, is that when I give a seminar, it's like five to six pages an hour, and when I give a grad class, it's three pages an hour. Maybe even three pages for 75 minutes. So I don't really know what this is. Uh, <laughs> so that really means I'm not really sure how far I'm going to get. Um, but uh, so uh, ballpark. So day one and two. Uh, well, this will be um, an introduction to um, Legendre and contact homology. So uh, so I'll give some background. Um, about Legendrian submanifolds. Um, then uh, I need to uh, give the definition uh, for LCA. So there's two definitions. There's a there's kind of the pseudo holomorphic J holomorphic curve version, and then there's Chekhanov's uh, combinatorial version for the special case of Legendrian knots in R3, so I plan to give both of those. Those both came out at the same time, historically. Um, and then uh, let's look at some applications and failures of this theory. Um, failures are just that, it goes back to this um, question here, where it fails, but it only seems but is it only failing because it has to fail, because it's, things are loose, they're flexible? Or is it just actually failing um, and it can't do any better? Um, applications or successes would be showing some rigidity phenomenon with this thing. OK, so then, then in the evening, um, Somnath is going to talk about um, uh, Lenny Eng's uh, common topological approach to not contact homology. Uh, so, that actually doesn't need really any of this. But in day two or day three, um, day two and three, we're going to talk about not contact homology um, from the LCH point of view. Um, so what Lenny defined with um, Topology and combinatorics could also be defined in from holomorphic curves. Uh, so I guess there's really two parts to that one. So there's, there's the not contact homology itself. And then um, I was going to talk about a kind of uh, a, uh, um, a, a, a filtration, a kind of um, a more subtle version, which I'll call uh, transverse not contact homology, which is, can be used to define uh, study transverse knots. Um, so this is a, another kind of combinatorial approach from LCH, different than Chekhanov's. And then for the last time, uh, I'll just squeeze it in. Okay, I'll use this little box right here. Okay. Uh, for the last, um, last part, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, cellular Legendrian contact homology. This is not for Legendrian this is for Legendrian spaces two-dimensional Legendrians inside five-dimensional contact spaces. Actually, it could be for any dimension, but uh, that beyond two, it's conjectural. And this kind of relates, kind of makes Legendrian contact homology look kind of like it has an algebraic topology flavor uh, in terms of chain maps, chain homotopies, and things of this nature. Um, so here, uh, really, we'll see how far um, to get. So. Uh, so in addition to the definition and some examples, um, I'd like to talk about the main application so far for this. And that is the notion of generating families versus uh, augmentations. So I'll define formally versus uh, um, 
micro-local sheafs, uh, so constructible sheafs. I'll just call it, leave it like that. So this is kind of the most recent sort of flavor of what people are doing. It's, it's, a, it's another completely different approach to coming from, you know, algebraic geometry and representation theory, but now kind of making its inroads into symplectic geometry and whole for curves. Anyway, so that's, that's the plan. So we'll see. Um, so I haven't given any definitions yet, so I'm not really um, necessarily expecting <clears throat> this to sink in yet. Okay. All right, so... Um, so just for the record, I'm going to start with a couple of basic definitions, at least it gets our notation consistent, even if I'm sure this has already been done. Um, so uh, Okay. Um, all right, so for us, I'm usually going to denote a symplectic manifold. Um, so this is a pair W which is 2n dimensional and omega that's our symplectic form so this is a uh, so this is a, a 2n dimensional smooth everything's um, everything everything's smooth here smooth manifold and this is a, a non degenerate closed 2 form uh, and we say that it's exact uh, if the two forms exact, so so if I can write it as omega is equal to d alpha for some one form alpha. Actually, it's normally written this way. I don't know. Anyway, um, okay, and then. Uh, we have this thing that I mentioned, I drew over there, this Lagrangian submanifold. So um, I guess usually people use L for Lagrangian and lambda for Legendrian, but since I'm coming from the Legendrian point of view, I'm saving my, save the Greek for the Lagrangian. Um, so, uh, okay. So it's a submanifold, um, an n dimensional submanifold. Um, such that um, omega restricted to the tangent bundle of lambda is zero. So this is the largest submanifold for which this is possible, based on the non-degeneracy condition of omega. You can't have an n plus one dimensional submanifold, n plus one linearly independent vectors, which, when paired together on omega, vanish. Um, uh, so. So lambda sitting inside an exact symplectic manifold is an exact Lagrangian. Well, uh, if if you think of it, if you think of this embedding, well, if you have this map uh, and you pull back um, And you pull back not the symplectic form, but you pull back the primitive, the alpha. You get something which is trivial in, homo in cohomology. And actually, um, for us, we're going to drop the embedding part. Uh, this this also um, um, we also consider uh, Lagrangian immersions. So immersions just means um, you can have double points, but they have to be transverse. Um, okay, so so the classic example, and this goes to Darboux's theorem, is uh, when you have um, of an exact symplectic manifold. Uh, well, actually, even more classic. Yeah, let's say 
T star Rn, where omega, you could write it as uh, dx wedge dy, which is the note, I'm going to use this as notation for summation dxi wedge dyi, where here the x's are the coordinates for Rn, and the y's are the fiber coordinates. So this is an exact Lagrangian sub, uh, sorry, exact symplectic manifold. And actually, um, for most of this talk, for most of, uh, of the talks that I'm giving anyway, um, we're going to look at something just only slightly more general. Uh, we're here. Um, X is a, is a smooth uh, n-dimensional manifold. So the cotangent bundle of manifold. And here X and Y are just locally defined coordinates. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so these are kind of the classical original uh, first set of examples. Okay, and... Um, all right, but anyway, so... Um, the first kind of interesting symplectic fact here is that uh, um, um, if I take a Lagrangian, an, an exact Lagrangian immersion in R2n, which I'm identifying as the cotangent bundle of Rn, um, then uh, it can't be an embedding. Um, the number of double points, which I'll call um, dp, is greater than or equal to 1. So this was originally due to uh, uh, Gromov. Um, but you can even see, you don't need anything fancy if n is 1. Um, so easy to check uh, in the one-dimensional case. So let's just, uh, let's just check that. Um, so... Um, well, okay, so first of all, what does it mean to be Lagrangian? Um, so, uh, so, when n equals 1, um, we have to make sure that uh, the, where is it, here, that omega vanishes on uh, the um, tangent bundle. But omega vanishes on the tangent bundle of any one-dimensional manifold. Um, so all one-manifolds are Lagrangian because omega on V comma, let's say, um, well, V1, V2, well, that's got to be omega on V1 times KV2. Sorry, KV1. This is or vi in the tangent bundle of lambda. Uh, and so then by symmetry, by anti-symmetry, skew symmetry, sorry, that uh, has to be negative itself, so it's got to be zero. You just pull the k out. Okay, so all Lagrangians are one-dimensional, so then, um, but obviously they're not all immersed. I could draw, just draw the circle by itself. That's a one-dimensional embedded Lagrangian, but it's not exact. Um, to be exact, so let me draw let me draw the cotangent bundle of R1. So this is R2 here. So to be exact, you have to actually have the total signed area is zero, because remember the pullback of this form has to be zero. So integrated along the fundamental class along S1. So, this is, so lambda is exact if and only if 
the signed area enclosed by it is zero. So for example, this is exact. Something like this is not exact. And then, you know, this is also not exact. You just compute this line integral and you see that it's, uh, I mean, curve integral, and you see that it's not zero. Um, in this theorem, that's true, right, because I could just take, yes, thank you. Yeah, in fact, Thank you. I could just take the x-axis, and that would disprove the theorem. Um, so you basically just have to kind of relate the area with a winding number and see that the winding number has to be zero, and, and therefore it has to have a, uh, a, you know, at least one double point. Um, uh, So it's not so bad. Uh, but for n bigger than 1, then it's actually uh, a little bit, some more work. And so actually for, so it's a kind of, it was kind of a, a rigidity problem. But um, the question that became, okay, so there's at least one, how many are there? Um, so here's kind of a, I guess I could say a first kind of open question. Um, so given uh, an exact closed uh, Lagrangian in R2n, uh, what is the minimum number of double points? And this is exactly the kind of question I'm talking about as in this original open question, is do, do holomorphic curves and the H principle meet in the middle to say what's loose and what's rigid. So, <clears throat> so previous results, so results towards this question, uh, so, so J holomorphic curves show that in some circumstances, uh, the, the number of double points is greater than or equal to one-half the sign of the sum of the Betty numbers. And uh, it's important, uh, let, me, let me just emphasize this. This is plus one times hi lambda. So if you're coming from differential topology only and not symplectic topology, you might be, you might be familiar with this guy the Euler characteristic as being some kind of lower bound of something like this. Uh, but in, that would be kind of a loose condition, but a, a kind of a, sorry, a topology property. But there's a symplectic geometry property where this, where, um, where uh, you know, you get a, 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 an absolute sum. Uh, on the other hand, you have an H principle uh, shows that in other cases, The number of double points equals one. Yeah. Sorry, what does exact mean? Oh, okay, so it means if you take, uh, if you pull back the one form, um, if you pull back the one form, the primitive, then you get uh, zero in cohomology. It, it is exact, but it's not compact. Oh, yeah. Right, so that, that was um, Yacht's point. Yeah, so maybe I should draw it here. So there, there, is, there is those examples. And I actually can't just throw in the word compact and get rid of that, because I, I, I do consider these kinds of exact Lagrangians, which are non-compact in one direction. Sorry? Oh, bigger. Okay. 
All right, that's, that's an important <laughs> feedback to get. Um, yeah, but how's the speed anyway? I have no idea. We've got a long time. I don't want to... That, is that okay? All right. Okay, bigger. All right, all right. So, so I'm supposed to give some open problems throughout this talk so you guys can try to answer them. So this is the first one. Uh, so um, improve what's known about this question. Ultimately, ideally showing it's either H principal or J homomorphic curves. That would be great. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to get that far. Um, okay. All right, so that's kind of um, on the symplectic side. Oh. Um, Yeah, maybe it's actually worth doing one more example just to show that it's not just an issue of being compact. Note that, um, I don't know, let's say Sn, well, anything, uh, sitting as the zero section in uh, T star Sn is exact, compact, and has no double points. So this is not going to be true for other manifolds. You pull back the standard form to the zero section, you get zero. The zero um, you pull back the uh, primitive to the zero section, you get the... Um, or even more generally, it doesn't even just have to be the zero section. Here, I'll draw T star Sn, or let's say T star S1, and here's the zero section. And I could just take the graph of the one form of some function to R. That's, that's also exact. Um, and uh, does not inter self-intersect. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. Um, all right. So, again, this is the talks, these talks won't really be about symplectic and Lagrangians, only in, only in the sense how they might help us study contact and Lagrangians. So let me give the definitions for those. So, uh, and also this is to, just to fix some notation. So I'm going to always use the letters, or try to always use the letters, M and C. So this is a is a uh, two n plus one dimensional. Um, it's a pair of a two n plus one dimensional manifold again smooth. Um, M and a, a two n dimensional distribution. C sitting inside the, coat the, the tangent bundle of M, which is, so let me put this in words, uh, in quotes, maximally non-enterable. Okay, so um, how to define this? Uh, so one way you could say this is, if L is a submanifold, such that its tangent bundle is in this distribution, then L can't be too big. In fact, if it's as big as possible, then it's called Legendrian. Oh, I've just got to write bigger. Um, so this is one way to say it. Another way to say it is, um, so, um, or I could say C 
is the kernel, at least locally, of a one form um, where if I take this maximal form here, I'm never zero. Alpha here is called a contact one form. A, not the contact one form for this contact manifold. Uh, and then, um, this is not a formal definition, but it kind of maybe helps get a picture of this, because these are kind of a bit indirect. So we say it's a contact manifold if C is as twisty as possible. So, okay, so all that's good. All right. Okay, so um, this is when you did over twisted contact structures. Okay. Okay, good. So, and I know there was a talk on Legendrians, but what was covered in that? Okay, so, so you did a, the front version. Okay, good. Um, all right. Um, Wait, so... <laughs> okay. All right, Somnath, what do you think? I'll let you be the tiebreaker. Uh, all right, well, let's see. Maybe I'll have to judiciously decide what to do. Um, okay. Um, So you did the front projection, but not the Lagrangian projection? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, um, oh, here's something that's worth doing, because I'm actually going to need this. Uh, so, so... You've probably, if you've done the contact manifolds, you've definitely done probably this standard example where, um, sorry, actually it's going the other way. Where here, if this is the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, I'm drawing the contact distribution planes. So it's the same going in x and z, but as you go in y, you start to twist one way going one y direction, and the other way going the other y direction. Um, never actually reaching 90 degrees. So this is, this is called um, the standard contact structure, which I can write as the kernel of dz minus y dx. To a contact geometer, this is actually going to be equivalent to um, uh, something a little more radially symmetric. Um, where here, okay, again, you start flat in the z direction, but now um, you rotate. You have some, I don't know if you can see this, but you have some sort of rotational symmetry. That is, there's a contact isotopy going from this, from one to the other. Um, so in this case, uh, we have um, 
contact isotopic. Uh, to, and same three manifolds, but now we're going to do kernel of um, dz minus r squared d theta, where r is the radius and theta is this angular coordinate. Um, so uh, this will be an example. Uh, th this is the one I'm going to need when, when I get to like this part of the talk even though this is kind of, this is the one I'm going to use most of the time. Um, but the point is, is that even though the geometric input is different, the auxiliary choices, uh, the algebraic output will be the same under the invariance of things. Now I should point out, if you rotate a little too far, so here you never actually reach 90 degrees, but if you continue to rotate all the way to 180 degrees, so this was covered, right? This is a twisted structure, and it becomes loose. So, um, so it may it may not look like the rotate you know stopping before 90 or, or before 180 is significant, but it really does change the game. It goes from being something that holomorphic curves can be used to study to something which the H principle says there's not too much to worry about. Um, okay. Um, so, also let me draw uh, the front projection, but also the um, Lagrangian projection. Um, so, um, um, okay. So if I if I take so again so like I said most of the time we'll be working with. Um, this, per this version, or the higher dimensional version, analog of it. Um, and in that version, uh, if L is sitting inside um, this contact manifold is Legendrian. So in this case, Legendrian means one dimensional n has to be 1, 2n plus 1 is 3. So instead of calling it a submanifold, we call it a Legendrian knot or link because it's one dimensional and it's diffeomorphic to the circle or circles. Um, there's kind of two useful projections to consider here. Uh, so we have the front direction. So here, I'm going to actually think of R3. Ah, I didn't actually define this yet. OK, sorry. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just explain this notation a bit. I'm going to call it what's called the one jet space of R1. And this space, this R2, I'm going to call the zero, zero jet space of R. And then we have this projection to x, y, and I'm going to call this plane, even though it's still just a plane, and this is R3, R2, and R2, I'm going to call this the cotangent bundle of R1. So um, if you were to draw some standard Legendrian, so I'm supposed to draw something which is tangent everywhere to these planes. It's hard to draw that, but imagine that the planes are kind of twisting and that's forcing your curve to go in a certain direction. Um, and you project it, you're going to have two kinds of different pictures. So here, let's call this projection pi sub f. f is for front. And let's call this direction pi sub c or pi sub log for a complex or Lagrangian projection. Then um, the fact that um, L is Legendrian um, means that going from the front projection 
the y coordinate is just d z d x and the z coordinate is the integral um, of y dx so again this means that legendrine means uh, uh, dz minus uh, y dx on this tangent bundle is zero. And if you solve for y, you get this. If you solve for z, you get that. Okay? Um, so basically, drawing here the um, projection of L in the complex direction, and the projection of L in the front projection, this pro these projections actually have enough information to recover this. Um, well, in this case, it's up to a shift in Z, but that's a Legendrian isotopy. So, up to a shift in Z. <laughs> From either um, the projection in, of, in the front or the projection in the base. Um, and uh, so, let's see, where am I? Um, right. And this actually, well, let me finish the one-dimensional case, and then I'll generalize this. Um, so you can check that um, <clears throat> you can check that uh, um, L is Legendrian <coughs> if and only if um, the projection of L is an exact Lagrangian. That's just basically saying that this integral is well-defined. Um, I guess I should be a little clever here because it could be a Legendrian immersion if I'm not too careful. But at least it's Legendrian. So maybe it's best to say it that way. Um, um, you can also check, so I guess the Legendrian isotopy, isotopy that was translated uh, That was already translated in the front. I'll just write it down again for the front case. So um, into three moves. Um, so you can have a kind of Reitermeister one move, uh, a Reitermeister two move, and a Reitermeister three move. Um, and in, uh, in, uh, the complex projection, so this is in the front projection, in the complex projection, it translates to, uh, just a Reitermeister one move. Sorry, Reitermeister two move. And a Reitermeister one move. Reitermeister three move. So actually, I, I'm being a little sloppy here, uh, and maybe it's maybe I should be careful. Um, so uh, so first of all. Here, I'm careful about drawing overcrossings and undercrossings. And here, I'm not. And that's because I could just see from the slope uh, that, for example, this strand... Um, oh, what happened to the other piece? That um, this strand... Well, is it an overcross, two overcrossings, two undercrossings? We should 
figure this out. Anyone have any idea? Here's the front projection. And we're supposed to be able to recover. So, okay, so um, here I'm not careful about drawing over crossings and under crossings. And here I am. I mean, I have to include all of them. And then there's a whole bunch that I'm not going to bother drawing. Here I'm not. So the reason is, is because um, the y-coordinate is determined by the slope of the z-coordinate. So here, this y-coordinate is very positive. This one's a little bit negative, and this one's a little bit positive. So, the y, so this is actually two undercrossings. This is actually has to be something that looks like this. It can't be the other way. You about to raise your hand? No, oh, um, uh, Here, it looks like it has to be under and then over the way I drew it. Because again, the slope is in between the slope of this positive, this positive slope and this negative slope. So I'm talking about the y-coordinate in this case. It's a higher y-coordinate. Here, we're talking about the z-coordinates. And for the z-coordinate, I can't tell because I need to integrate some global thing. I have no idea if this strand is above or below that strand unless I actually go through and integrate around and see what happened to my z-coordinate. Am I higher or lower when I start here and end up there. Um, so that's all. Um, OK, good. Now I won't worry as much about repeating stuff. <laughs> that was, um, OK. Um, all right. Um, so there's a higher dimensional analog to all this uh, that we'll be working with more often. Um, what am I doing? 17 minutes left. OK. Um, so there's a higher dimensional analog to be, uh, we'll be working for this, and that is um, Or more general. It's it's also, you know, this could x could be s one. More general. Uh, so now, rather than R three, uh, we're going to look at what's called the one jet space. So let's let x be a smooth manifold. Then um, j one of x n. This is defined as um, well, you can take it as a definition. It's the cotangent bundle of x cross r. And we'll generally, that's a one-dimensional r, and we'll use a z-coordinate here, x-coordinate here, y-coordinate here. And um, the contact form c is again going to be the kernel of this dz minus y dx. And again, I mean, because I'm dealing with lots of Coordinates here, I really mean summation yi dxi. Okay? Um, and the reason why it's called the one jet space is because um, uh, if you take the manifold given by, let's say, x df um, f of x for some function some smooth function from x to r, real value function on x. Um, this is called the one jet of f, and it's Legendre. Um, so it's the analog of maybe what I was drawing somewhere. Well, I guess I erased it. but. Uh, 
the, the, one, the, the graph of a one form, the graph of a one jet. Uh, and we can do for the same thing. We still have um, the front projection which by definition is just the x-coordinate and the z-coordinate, and the complex direction, complex projection, which is just the x and y-coordinate. And um, so this is now n plus one dimensional, this is two n-dimensional. And so the advantage of this is that um, it, you can start drawing things in higher dimensions. Uh, so for example, um, Again, we have, we can recover the z-coordinate. And all the y-coordinates. Where now you just take partial derivative of z in the x-coordinate direction. <coughs> so can recover uh, l from pi c of l or the front projection of L via these formulae, formula. Uh, um, so here, a, a typical picture might be something like, and now I can really only draw it you know, the next dimension up, I can only really draw it here because this is a three-dimensional ambient space and this is a four-dimensional ambient space for a five-dimensional, for Legendre inside five dimensions. So, for example, um, uh, If L is inside, let's say, J1 of, let's just make it R2. So this is standard contact R5. So now it's, to be Legendrian, you have to be a surface. And I want to draw it, so I'm going to look at the front projection, because I can always recover the Legendrian from its front projection, and I only need three... directions in the zero jet space of R2. And so it might look something like this. Um, so this, this is supposed to, I mean, I'm being a little sloppy here. I should probably be careful about this. Uh, um, this is supposed to be a say, a circle of cusps where the partial, all the partial derivatives of this sheet and the partial derivatives of this sheet agree as you approach this cusp. So that the y-coordinates, at least you can see, are continuous, but actually smooth. So it doesn't look very smooth in the projection, but upstairs it is a smooth sphere, two-sphere. And it doesn't have to always be horizontal. I'm trying to draw it on a slant here to indicate, look, the partial derivatives could all be positive you know, or non-zero along this points of the circle. Um, <clears throat> so um, I can't really draw it, uh, like I said, in R4, but I can make some comments about this. Here is an example of a, in R4, in the tangent bundle of R2, uh, pi C of L is an exact Lagrangian with exactly one double point. So a double point means that um, the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates have to agree. Right? It's a, it's, an, it's, a Lagrangian, it's a Legendrian surface, so in R5 there's no double points. But in this four-dimensional space, these guys have one transverse double point. So, if we look here, we need to find somewhere, some indication that somewhere I could find two points on this surface which have the same x and y coordinates. So anyone see where they might be, two points on this surface? 
Pardon? The, that's right, exactly. Here and here. Okay. In this case, the y coordinates are both zero because it's like a max and a min. That's just coincidence. I mean, it might be here. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> Let's say it's like that. Here and here. Okay. The y coordinates. We have two parallel planes that are not horizontal planes. Um, <clears throat> right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not getting. <laughs> sorry, the definition of Luzerne contact homology today. Yeah. There's no y here because um, I've projected out the y coordinates. So there's just x1, x2, and z. Maybe, maybe I should do this as two and this is one. That, that was just arbitrary. So here, um, here you project out the yi's, and here you project out the z. But the point is that you can recover all the yi's just from partial multivariable calc. From this, doing this. OK. Um, all right, I'm not following this at all. Oh, OK. Um, so, OK, I'll skip that. Um, Yeah. Okay, uh, let me just, I'm not going to get, I've only got seven minutes and 43 seconds left. So let me just um, get as far as I can on the geometric input for Legendrian contact homology, uh, because it kind of fits in here, this, in, in, in these pictures. And then uh, we'll have to save the definition for the beginning of the next lecture. Um, so I need uh, what's known as a Reeb chord. Um, and actually, it'd be nice to do this now because I've got all these pictures. So, um, so, so if you fix not only the contact manifold, but also and the contact form. Recall that means that uh, if you take the kernel of this one form, you get the contact distribution. You have to remember that for a contact manifold, I don't care about, I mean, it's, it's, this is not intrinsic to the contact manifold. This is the distribution which is intrinsic. This is a choice. If I take this and I multiply it by some, by two, I get the same distribution. Or I multiply it by a non-zero function, I get the same distribution. Um, the um, Reeb vector field, Uh, associated, I'll call it R alpha, uh, associated to alpha, uh, is defined by um, d alpha of R alpha uh, is zero, and alpha of R alpha is one. So right from this condition here, you can see that R alpha has to be transverse to C. Um, because uh, D alpha is uh, non-singular, non-degenerate on C. So if I find some vector that no matter what I'm paired with, I get zero. Um, it can't be in the contact distribution itself, but pointing transverse to it. Um, so, okay. Uh, and then the next thing we need to define are the Reeb chords. So now, so we're gonna. F so again, we fix M, C, and alpha. And now we also fix the Legendrian L. Then uh, the 
alpha chords, and I'll just write it alpha reeb chords of L are um, reeb flows or flows of the reeb vector field that start and end on L. So if we take this example here, um, so I'm going to fix J1 of X, and C, I'm going to fix this contact form that I keep writing down. Then um, the Reeb vector field The Reeb vector field associated to this is just going to be d by dz. And so here we see um, <coughs> um, going back to this example here, uh, we see that um, maybe I'll keep this one up too. So going back to, um, let's say, x is r1 or r2, and l is as drawn before, we see that the Reeb vector field is just going to be schematically represented by this segment here. Because this flows in the d by dz direction. And it starts and ends on L. Now you might say, well, what about something like that? But the problem with that is um, <laughs> these have uh, different y coordinates. So if I flow in the z direction, I'm not going to be able to change from this negative y-coordinate to this positive y-coordinate. Here, if I flow in the z-direction, I'm starting and ending on the same y-coordinate. So I do start and end on the Legendrian upstairs. Really, this is, this is going on upstairs. So this is just a schematic representation. So this is... So uh, you can check... Let's just make this as homework. So that actually, my out of time. Oh no, one minute and 37 seconds. Okay. Um, so check that the, uh, again in this setup, the Reeb chords of L are in one to one correspondence with the double, okay, the double points of the complex projection of L. Um, yeah. Um, Is it worth it to even give homework, or is it like a lot of homework? Okay. Here's another, another homework you can check. Uh, this one, you can uh, the solution in Geiges' book. For another example, uh, let's let um, M alpha be, uh, this is the next standard example you do. Uh, this is just to show in contrast. It's going to be this contact form. Uh, so think of this as the unit sphere in R4, and take the restriction of this one form, which is using all four coordinates in R4, but restricted to the unit sphere. Okay, so I'm picking my alpha form here. Um, so compute the... Um, compute um, the Reeb vector field and... Uh, show that um, the orbits, uh, OK, that's it. Just compute the Reeb vector field. <laughs> All right, so I'll pick it up um, from here tomorrow. Now I can't talk anymore, right?
Yeah, if you need it. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I'll just move on. Yes, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, I can answer questions. Oh, second homework problem. Oh, uh, just. <laughs> All right, fair enough question. Um, thank you for allowing me to extend that via question. Uh, uh, show that the orbits of the three vector field um, uh, define the fibers of the hop vibration. Um, uh, where the hop vibration, uh, so you think of this fibering over um, CP1, and you're sending the point Z1, Z2 in complex space to uh, Z1, the point Z1 colon Z2 in CP1. Um, and if you need help with this, uh, the solution is in, in Hans Geiges' Introduction to Contact Topology book. Okay, so that was just another contact manifold, and it's Reeb Dynamics. Yeah, so I'm pretty close to Legendre in contact. That was the main ingredient, that and the curves, of course. But um, I'll get to that next time. So are there any other questions? Okay, all right, so let's thank uh, Michael again.